go. You're probably going there. I'm so frustrated. Come on, I've done it. <laughs> New to me too. I like watching with you a, talk. <laughs> it's the first one with a menage a trois. So this is my first, and I had to put something down at the bottom to be able to allow you in. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. pretty funny. All right. Hi, Annie. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having us. Oh, thanks for joining us. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm I'm excited. So I. I just had a quick um, look on your website and I'm, I'm a mother of, well, we're a blend, so I have five. Um, my two little, littlest, I just resonated with your, um, in the first year, mothers spend eight, 1800 hours feeding their baby. And I was just feeding mine and ran in here. I actually had to pull them off the boob and say, sorry, bud, gotta go, <laughs> have a puff. <laughs> um, but it resonated with me and I thought, oh my goodness. And then what I loved as well was, um, 92% of women feel unprepared for the fourth trimester. I thought that was absolutely classic because um, yeah. it's so true, right? It's it just it goes to, without saying that nobody prepares you for parenting. Um, and then certainly they don't even really tell you much what to expect in the birthing process. And then mm -hmm. post, post birth, it's like, here, take them home. Good luck. <laughs> so exactly. So I, I think that's, it looks like Annie's buffering. Um, oh, we lost her. Let me try again. But that's yeah. where you guys come in today. Exactly. To share well, and that's what, some that's of your expertise. Of why we founded our business, because that's what we realized that women don't really, and families don't get the support they need. And so we're trying to kind of fill that gap. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it. Well, let us talk to us a little bit about you guys and how you got your start. Yeah. Um, so Annie and I met in school for occupational therapy. So we're both occupational therapists. And we always had this idea that there's something more than, you know, the typical traditional healthcare system in the United yeah. States. So once we both kind of were in the same place and realized what we wanted that to be, um, we started our business. So just last year, we were just finishing our first year of business. Um, nice. And I focus on the women's health side of things. So I'm a birth doula yeah. and a pelvic floor therapist. And Annie focuses on the child development side of things so we have kind okay. of that well-rounded approach excellent all right so you guys started in 2021 after covid hanging out not being able to see your patients trying to do occupational therapy via zoom which is a challenge to <laughs> say the least right i've been there i became the therapist for for one of mine um, physical therapist. I'm like, how do I do this? What do I do? Like, okay, you've never even touched a muscle. How do you know that she doesn't have tone? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, so I yeah. get it. Yeah. And I think too, like, I mean, during that time, our journey of starting this whole business, I got pregnant. Um, okay. and kind of going through that whole, you know, process myself, it's just, mm -hmm. you learn quickly how little I knew, I feel like about pregnancy and postpartum. And then also just even having my own little infant, like, knowing infant development, but watching it firsthand and being a part of that, there's just, sure. I feel like such a need for a lot more education and just resources for women kind of going through that huge transitional part of their life. And so huge. I think 100%. that kind of pushed us forward into like, let's do this. Let's and do this. Just and let's just <laughs> jump right in. Yeah. You know, it's really true. I mean, it, it's a marvel. Here we are. Um, you know, medicine has come so far. Technology has come so far. Everything has come so far. Um, and yet I felt more prepared to actually get married than I did to have a baby yes. because there are way more magazines. There are way more resources. There are way more people coming out to help you and to be proactive who, yes, they want your money, but you know, they're, they're there for you. Right. As opposed to childbirth, where mm -hmm. it's like, everyone's stoked for you, but nobody tells you about, you know, the good, bad, the ugly in terms of what to expect because nobody knows. I mean, there's no crystal ball for how your particular no. journey is going to go. And I think the biggest um, misnomer is that you can actually plan for the day because yeah. you can't, right? You don't know what's going to happen, but you can have ideas. And, and it's really, I guess it's really truly the first induction into parenting where we're all doing the best we can with the tools we have. And you can have, you know, things in your mind, but you have to at some point realize that you have to let those go um, yeah. and just, just wing it and do the best yeah. you can and, yeah. and be prepared for the worst and hope for the best, right? Yeah. I mean, that's it exactly. in a nutshell. Yep. So, yeah. okay, well, we're on the same page there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't have a single pregnancy that went according to plan. Um, yeah, they're right. all unique and they're all special yeah. and they're all part yeah. of the fabric of my life. Yeah. Um, and I got, you know, fortunately I brought home three little nuggets. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's definitely one of those journeys that 
um, you're you're not as well prepared as you could be about many other things in life, nor mm -hmm. licensed. Yeah. <laughs> right. All right. Well, I know that we've got a lot of folks on on uh, joining us today. So because you guys have such kind of a, 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 a cool range of services for, for kids as well as parents on their Welcome to Life with Baby journey, um, mm -hmm. how about we kick off um, maybe – Maybe we do uh, the women's health before the kids because mm -hmm. it's the chicken and the egg type thing. Um, so we have some particular questions that I, I want to try to answer for folks um, who showed an interest. Um, so we'll start with those and then we can just talk about in general anything you feel like we haven't um, touched base on. And then we can certainly um, direct people to your website so that they can, whether it's the 15 minute, you know, check in or whatever to see if, if your services would be right for them. And let me just ask you, uh, you guys are based in Denver, but does that limit you to be able to, um, service only Denver residents or are you guys able to offer your services across the nation or country? Yeah, so, go ahead. It kind of depends on the service. So because okay. we're occupational therapists, we're licensed in the state of Colorado, so we can provide occupational therapy services in the state of Colorado, okay. whether that's in person or virtual. But sure. we provide other like virtual wellness co consultations and parent education and doula services across the nation. Gotcha. So okay. It just depends. Great. Good to know because there are people who are going to be oh I want to I want to reach out to them I just want to make sure they they can. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so for women's health, I'm going to start with some of the questions. And then if there's anything that you guys want to talk broadly about, please feel free or interrupt at any time. So someone wrote in that they're seven months pregnant. Congratulations. Um, and she wants to know, she wants to get back to running ASAP after having her baby. What does she need to do to prepare? And I know that I was always in the perfect situation because they say you can continue doing what you're doing when you're pregnant, but don't start something new. So I never had to exercise. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was never quite, you know, owning it when I got pregnant. <laughs> so it was like I took it as my marching orders. Can't start now. Nope. <laughs> yeah, but, and that's that's something we actually hear a lot, and it's it's not something that I recommend. So it doesn't mean just because you weren't doing something before you're pregnant, it doesn't mean you can't do it when you're pregnant sure. or postpartum. So you know, under the direction of somebody who kind of knows what they're doing and can guide you it through that process. Um, that's kind of something we hear often, but it's not always recommended. Um, yeah. But for somebody who is pregnant and wants to get back to running postpartum, I would say definitely check in with somebody pregnant. So I always recommend that pregnant people see a pelvic floor therapist. Um, there's a lot that they can work on, not just to prepare you for birth, but to kind of get you kickstarted in what you need to be focusing on postpartum. Um, a lot of us hear that you know, golden six week rule where once you hit the six weeks, you can go back to exercise. And that's not necessarily the case. And everybody heals at a different rate, depending on the birth process and depending on, you know, all of your individual factors. Um, so I definitely say check in with somebody while you're pregnant, kind of jumpstart that process. And then once you're postpartum, also check in with that person again. And there's a lot that you can do just kind of to rebuild the foundational core and pelvic floor to have a solid foundation before you get back to higher intensity movement. Because um, running is very high impact. Um, and the, Annie, this is close to Annie because she's a runner. Yeah. Um, and this is actually something she's getting back to postpartum too. So she can, she can chat a little bit yeah. about that too. Yeah. I mean, it's something near and dear to my heart. I've been a runner my whole life. Um, and I was amazed, I would say postpartum, how weak I think some of the muscles that I just depend on always having were, um, or just, you know, it, my body was different. You birthed a child. And so I think I've really learned that it's really important to slow down and like build those foundational like core muscles um, in your pelvic floor muscles before you go into that high intensity intensity and like having run in college, like I ran, you know, in college collegiately. So, you know, I thought I could just put on my shoes and go and I learned very quickly that you cannot do that. And so I really, really recommend, you know, and you just start with like basic breathing into your deep core and like learning where your pelvic floor muscles are. Um, and strengthening those before you kind of get into like more of the high intensity, high impact. So it's kind of like one on ones, definitely specific to like what your body needs. Sure. But there's a lot of cool resources out there that we could, you know, link and send to people to for postpartum um, to kind of get back to that exercise, like where you need to be. But yeah. it's process. But I definitely respect your body and like listen to it and just go in with the expectation that it might not be the same, but you'll get back to it if you take care of yourself, you know, kind of from the yeah. get postpartum yeah no that's really interesting because I, I actually didn't realize that there was there were particular exercises you could do to focus on 
making the pregnancy, um, the actual birthing process easier on your body. Um, mm -hmm. And I, it took me third time's a charm, right? Um, to figure that out. But, but I was also 10 years younger when I had my first. So my body bounced back differently than it did on um, mm -hmm. COVID baby and then the baby before. So there, learning curve, right? When you know better, you do better. Yes. And it's not going to happen again. But if I were to become pregnant, I would know that there are certain things I could do to make sure that I don't have any pelvic floor issues. So yeah. very, very good insights. And, and there are a lot of resources out there with people with sp specific information like you guys have. So mm -hmm. definitely an option for a lot of folks. Um, okay, eight weeks postpartum, and I still don't feel ready for sex. Is this normal? Anything I can do? We're all yes. nodding. Yes. <laughs> for sure. It's normal. Yes. Let's clear that out Totally there. normal. Totally normal. <laughs> and, and that's I only eight that... weeks. That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. I just think that also goes with, you know, that magic six week mark where a lot of people go into their doctor, or their midwife, and they, they hear that they're cleared for sex or that everything healed well, and they look good. And it's like, what does that mean? Like, what? I don't think it feels good. Like, what does that really mean? So um, that's totally normal. Again, everybody kind of heals at their own rate and feels ready at their own rate. And there's so many factors besides just your physical body, you know, you've gone through a huge life change you've tra transitioned into motherhood or ha having a second or third or fourth and you're going through a lot of changes you know there's vaginal dryness if you're breastfeeding there's all those hormonal changes so there's so much going on you're probably exhausted on top of it all um so i'd say it's absolutely normal and if there's any concern about pain with sex or not feeling comfortable with you know, inserting anything into the vagina, that's definitely something that a pelvic floor therapist can work on, um, you know, at your own rate. And there are also um, a lot of cool tools and tricks that you can use. Um, we could link a couple of things that, you know, we recommend to clients to help make that process a little easier and smoother. Um, and recommendation number one is lots of loop is always <laughs> the right answer. <laughs> Lots of live. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of communication and like letting your partner yeah. know that you're just not there yet because it's very normal not to be ready right away. Yeah. So. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, our touch sensors are getting touched all the time by yeah. little humans who really s need us for survival, right? So mm -hmm. there's that box is being ticked. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, um, someone said they had their six week postpartum appointment and the doctor didn't men mention anything about pelvic floor therapy. How do I know if I should see one? The therapist, I presume. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's also super common, especially in the States. I know in a lot of other countries, especially in Europe, it's kind of standard of care to get a referral to a pelvic floor therapist after birth because it's a major physical event to your body. So if you think about any other major event, or not even, you get an ankle sprain, you'll go see a therapist. Sure. So if you've had a major event to your body, you should be referred to a therapist. Um, so we always recommend that anyone postpartum see a pelvic floor therapist just for a check-in, um, and especially if they're having any symptoms that are concerning. Um, so it's it's common that a doctor won't recommend it, and it, it kind of comes on to the patient to ask for a referral or to seek out services on their own. So in Colorado, we're a direct access state which means you don't need a physician referral. So a lot of our clients come to us because they have issues that they want to work on and their doctor didn't recommend anything. So they kind of sought us out on their own. But definitely like if they're experiencing any pain, discomfort, you know, heaviness, anything that doesn't feel normal. I mean, things are not going to feel normal after having a baby, but <laughs> I'm like Annie, yeah. I'm feeling normal at this point. <laughs> no, no, I still don't feel normal, but <laughs> the idea is you know, you, you know your body best. So listen yeah. to that. And if things don't feel comfortable, like it's totally worth reaching out and trying to find somebody to help you because you deserve that for sure. So right, right. That's interesting. Um, so your recommendation is that basically any woman going through the childbirthing process see a pelvic floor mm -hmm. therapist. And, and it's it's common in Europe. That's the norm. Mm -hmm. it's amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're advanced in so many ways and, and kind of still behind in so many ways. Really yeah. interesting. Yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, I kind of, I'm also shocked. Like my husband, he's not a big like chiropractor guy, but you know, I am and I take my kids to it and, and um, you know, I've seen amazing differences. It's the circuitry of our body. But mm -hmm. when he saw, and he looked over the curtain, right, which you aren't supposed to in the C-section, <laughs> when he saw what they were torquing out of my body, 
Mm -hmm. He was a believer and he's like, I can't believe that every baby born doesn't have to have chiropractic care, right? Mm -hmm. and was, it was finally eye opening for him to say, oh my gosh, you know, that's mm -hmm. like, that's not okay. You know, like how, how their body contorts and then they're just expected to be okay. You know? yeah. So it, in my mind, that's where my mind went is like, probably yeah. every baby should have chiropractic too. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, Interesting. Okay, so someone else. I've been leaking for three years and finally going to see a pelvic floor therapist in a few weeks. I'm a little nervous. What will the appointment be like? Um, so it totally depends kind of on the therapist and the setting. Um, so if it's like an outpatient clinic, um, it might be, um, you know, private room, you see a therapist. Um, a lot of times they'll talk through um, their background, their history, their um, birth stories, if that is relevant to them, um, nutrition, intake in terms of food and water. Um, and then they'll go through kind of an external physical assessment. And then if there's consent, an internal um, vaginal exam as well, pelvic floor muscle exam. Um, so it depends where it is. So for example, we do in-home services. So I go to somebody's house. Um, mm -hmm. We've talked through it all beforehand. We kind of chat about their goals and what they want to do, um, what the issues are, and then um, talk through every stage of the process. So always looking at physical first, going through daily movements, functional motion, and then getting to an internal exam where we can assess individual pelvic floor muscles and kind of see what's going on. Um, but it really is a whole picture. It's total body. We're looking at posture. We're looking at breathing. Um, and then all of the medical history and background is really important too. So it's okay. nothing to, I mean, it's, it's nerve wracking. Um, Annie and I have both done it and it can feel <laughs> intimidating, but it's not at all like a pelvic exam at an OB's office. And it's not it's much gentler than that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it it's yeah. right. And with a good therapist, it's really a, a, a good process. Okay. What, and when you mention uh, medical history is important, uh, are those in terms of medical files that maybe someone should prepare in advance, like kind of their, o their OBGYN files um, just in general or any? Not necessarily. More, more of their report on their history. So if they've been constipated, if they've had issues, oh, okay. if they had, you know, an accident where they fell on their tailbone 10 years ago, okay. all that kind of stuff that tends to come out in conversation. So okay. we don't necessarily need all of it from a doctor, but we, we pull it out kind of in conversation of, sure. of what their history is like. Okay. That's interesting. And, I wouldn't yeah. have thought about that. It's yeah. There's like birth history too, kind of how their birthing processes went. Sure. Okay. Um, someone, someone online uh, live asked if pelvic floor exercises are recommended during pregnancy. Yeah, so that kind of depends what you're thinking of. A lot of times we think of pelvic floor exercises as Kegels, which are right. contractions of your pelvic floor muscles. Right. Um, what we forget a lot of times is the contraction, or we, we do the contraction, we forget the relaxation. So a muscle is at its strongest and healthiest when it can go through its full range of motion, meaning it can fully contract and fully relax. Okay. So the, the problem with just a blanket statement of do pelvic floor exercises or do Kegels is a lot of times women will do that full contraction and not be able to relax so you end up with tight pelvic floor muscles and that's actually an issue when you go to birth your baby because it's not gonna come out right, right. so and at that point of, you want that baby out yeah right a lot of our work in pregnancy is actually in relaxing and lengthening the pelvic floor and learning how to strengthen your deep core muscles and relax the pelvic floor but okay. It's very individual. It depends on the person and their history. So some people have very relaxed pelvic floor muscles. More often than not, they're very tight because we hold tension there. So yeah. I would not recommend blanket statement, do pelvic floor exercises during pregnancy. Right. I would recommend see a pelvic floor therapist and get an individualized <laughs> plan of what you need. Okay, okay got it. Um, I just had my second baby and I know we'll probably try for three. Should I wait to see a pelvic floor therapist in, until I'm done having babies? I think you kind of just answered that. Yeah. Okay. We're so. going to push it. Always see one if you, if you feel like you need to. Gotcha. Okay, got it. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So, Annie, let's switch over to you and your specialty. Um, so, the kids. Mm -hmm. So, we have specific questions. Almost 10-month-old who's still not crawling and hates tummy time. Mm -hmm. Any tips to build muscles, and is it time to worry? Mm-hmm. 
Yes. Um, know that lots of babies don't like tummy time. Very common. So you're not alone. Um, yep. When it comes to crawling, um, that's kind of, I like to talk about milestones in terms of like a range. Like, you know, not every kid is going to, you know, roll or crawl at a certain age and then a certain age for sure. all the other ones. Um, anyway, so with crawling, um, you know, that kind of tends to emerge, I think seven to 11 months. So you're, you're on the cusp, but you're okay. I wouldn't be like too concerned yet. Yeah. Um, you can always see a pediatric OT if you like want more of a personal evaluation for that. Um, but to build strength, so for crawling itself, um, you know, tummy time, you can do it in a lot of different positions. So instead of just laying the kid like flat on the floor and they scream because they don't like it, you could put like roll up a towel and put it underneath their chest um, kind of here to help support some of those muscles. So it's a little bit easier for them. Um, I know my little one really likes it if I do it on my knees. So they're like face to face. They really like to interact with you. So any way that you can kind of get your face at their level, they tend to enjoy tummy time more. You could do it on a big like exercise ball. So there's lots of fun different ways um, to do tummy time to try to build those muscles because it is important for crawling. Sure. Other activities for crawling too, like muscle building, playing and side lying is really important. Um, so just kind of propping them up on their side. You could put a towel behind them if they need more support. And then also lots of play just like in the air. Um, so when they're reaching their arms up in the air and playing with different toys, they're building a lot of their arm and shoulder muscles. Mm -hmm. And then you can also put them in like that crawling position. So like turning them on to all hands and like knees because um, they're starting when they're weight bearing through those muscles again, they're building strength. So there's lots of different fun ways um, to kind of put them in different positions and play with them to build those muscles. But mm -hmm. you don't need to worry yet. Um, I would assume it will come. And if yeah. you need help, go see a pediatric OT. We'd love to help you out. Yeah. So. All right. Um, should my baby be sitting up on her own before I put her in a, says Bumbo, we say baby pod in yeah. our world, or yes. a seated activity chair? Yes. Um, I, my rule of thumb normally for those is I would like to see the kid being able to hold, obviously have like neck control and head control. And then you really want to make sure they're not like leaning all the way over to like one side. Cause that then means their like trunk's not really strong enough to be sitting kind of in like a supported seating situation. So make sure you see all those signs before you're kind of putting them in those, um, supported seating, different contraptions, containers. Yeah. And they aren't meant to be babysitters. I mean, they're meant no. to not 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 by any stretch of the imagination so um okay toddler constipation my kid is almost um three slash five maybe two of them um and been potty trained for almost a year and is terrified of pooping in the potty she'll wait until her pull up at night or hold it for a week how do we help her without having her live on Miralax? yes uh Kids are very commonly nervous about the potty. Um, it kind of depends. So I would like if I were seeing with the, working with the family or the kid, I would want to know maybe talking to the kid what maybe is scary about the bathroom. Mm -hmm. There's lots of different tips and tricks. So you could, um, you know, we just actually did an Instagram post, I think, on this. Did I, Courtney? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. so it's like fun different ways, like for the potty, like you can make it a fun environment. So you can put stickers in there. You could like hang things on the wall. Sometimes kids really like to have a potty friend. So you could, they get a special toy that they get to bring in there with them. Um, supported so in terms of like pelvic health um, supported seating so you really want them to like be seating with their feet touching a flat surface so whether that's a potty on the floor or you're having something over the potty that they can sit in like a supported seating that makes it more comfortable and easier to go to the bathroom for them sure. um, and the other big thing we see with kids um, you might not even think your kids constipated because they are pooping every day but they still could be constipated so really making sure they have lots of fiber in their diet and drinking lots of water because um, kids get really scared of going in there if they know it's going to hurt and they try to hold it and really don't want to go because it's a painful experience. So water, um, lots of fiber. And then I just tell parents to really just try to have the kids like sit for five minutes um, in the morning and in the evening and like full five minutes, whether they need to like watch a show or something to like give them the chance to try to go. Um, that also can help with constipation as well. So lots I of tips. We, I, we've done a few of uh, potty training experts as well. And I think yeah. what what is um, overarching and consistent is, and what we've seen too um, in, our, in our business is uh, having them feel safe and secure mm -hmm. um, on the potty seat, whether they're on a standalone potty on the floor or on a potty seat reducer, but having yeah. them feel comfortable, safe, secure uh, yeah. goes a long way to eliminating fears, anxiety, and concerns yeah. over the body training process. It's like, it's like anything, you know, the equipment that you use, the better equipment, you know, the mm -hmm. better outcome in many instances. And mm -hmm. that's what we found because a lot of the, I, I talk about, you know, that a lot of the licensed characters, they're just, um, you know, soft foam, like mm -hmm. yellow, usually yellow, um, open pore, 
yeah. open, open cell phone that as soon as the child sits on it, they just bottom out. Yep. And it's a hard plastic ring. And mm -hmm. when they get up, they've got lines across their legs. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's just not comfortable. Um, no. and so so it, it goes a long way. So that yeah. would be one little tidbit that I can add from, from our yeah. experience. And I, I feel like, you know, I can safely say that around the world we've won awards, but we do the best in potty. Yeah. Um, because nature can take time to call, that's yeah. for sure. And they need to be comfortable. So Yes. Um, okay, giving, so yeah, go ahead, autonomy sorry. and choices. You know, just like you're saying, giving them autonomy and choices, like making yeah. them a part of the process and not just sticking them there and like expecting them to go. That's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, seven month old, mostly rolling to right, only from back to belly, and isn't sitting up on her own. Tips? Um, yeah, rolling. Kids sometimes have preferences for like which side they roll to. More often, that's okay. That's pretty normal. Um, I think the rule of thumb with like rolling, like you're basically their body's going to follow where their head is looking. And so a lot of times it's putting play and things in front of their head. So they kind of get that arching motion, um, that kind of pre-roll motion. So like having them follow or attract something that they really like um, and having them kind of bring their head around will help kind of push them into that rolling motion. So playing that way a lot with them, lots of tummy time, lots of all those like different strengthening muscles that we were talking about earlier. Um, yeah. And then also some tricks too is like you can kind of put them on a towel or a blanket and you can kind of kind of pull the blanket up and over to help them kind of roll. So you just want them to learn how to weight shift. And so the more that you like let them practice that and feel that motion, the more that it will become easier and easier of a skill for them. So that's a good trick. I imagine yeah. the towel makes them feel like safe and secure in that motion too. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then they're, they're not, I mean, go slowly. Like you don't need yeah. to like, yeah, yeah. come over by any means, but like it's a very yeah. controlled way to like help yeah. them feel yeah. that weight shift and learn how to like do that themselves so that's a good, that's a good tip mm -hmm. uh, um any advice resources for a six-year-old who's been fully potty trained for years but still can't do it at night yeah and that's one i would like um i'm also a pediatric pelvic floor therapist so i work with all the kids on the pelvic floor side um that could be something where you kind of want to reach out and get more specialized to know what's going on but a lot of times for that for bedwetting at night a lot of it is either surprisingly constipation um so it's putting pressure on their bladder and that's causing accidents at mm -hmm. night it also could be just they're really heavy sleepers some kids just like are those deep deep sleepers and so they're not feeling that sensation that they need to pee um so there's a lot of like therapy work we can do with that um and then also just like sometimes if there's those kids that like hold it because they're so excited and they don't want to like go to the bathroom all day it actually can turn into like an overactive bladder so that at night it's releasing their bladder is almost overactive and it's happening all night long and having wedding accidents so Three different like kind of those could be three different reasons why and there's kind of three different ways to like treat all those so I definitely would reach out to a specialist or to us we'd kind of do like just virtual consultations in the sense of like just education and I could educate on different ways to like deal about deal with all three of those different kind of potential problems. Okay. But, but bedwetting is very common. Um, yeah, for a lot of kids in the United States and I think globally but we definitely work with a lot of kids here with that. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Well, great. Well, I, I appreciate it. We try to, with the toolbox, we know that moms are busy, dads are busy. So yes. we try to keep it in relatively bite-sized 30 minute slots. Mm -hmm. But um, So I think we covered a lot. We, we covered a lot of the, the questions that were, you know, people wanted to know. So I, I, I always feel good at the end about doing that. And then if, if there are folks who have more questions, um, you guys have a great website at um, ownyourmotherhood.com and then mm -hmm. they can also find you guys on Instagram uh, ownyourmotherhood.llc correct mm -hmm. um, so yeah I, I appreciate both your time Courtney and Annie and I'm glad we got um, we're, we're, we're in our, our technologically advanced <laughs> first menage a trois so yes love it <laughs> so, appreciate your time and, and yeah. thank you for helping the process of, of motherhood um, becoming a little bit more uh, heavily ensconced in resources because it is totally winging it. And the yep. whole point is to, to put more tools in everyone's toolbox. So yep. appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you me. so much. Yeah. Right. Take care, guys. See you. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.